Now, Ian, you're specialist in the bonkai. That's the application of kata. Tell me a little bit how you got into that. Uh, for me, my, the reason I got into the martial arts was the practical self-defense side of it, yeah. you know. Um, so that's why I went. And obviously, when you start martial arts, you know nothing about kata. You just you, yeah. you, you go along to, to learn. Um, one of the things I, I, I found myself drawn to kata. There's something about it that, that I really like. Yeah. Uh, my, my own view on it, I don't, I'm not self-aware to maybe not fully know, but I think it's because you don't have to hold back with kata. In the yeah. same way that I like pad work and bag work, because you can give it, give it your all, you know? Yeah. So um, kata was something that I was drawn to. Self-defense was why I originally got into it. So the two just kind of got linked together. Uh, and I, again, I was very lucky that I had a very open-minded uh, instructor who kind of encouraged us to yeah. uh, explore the kata. Kata was a big part of his teaching. He was a guy called Doug James, who's an eighth dan in, in Wado. Yeah. So he would encourage us to kind of explore these things. He would get other instructors in to give us their interpretation of things. Yeah. So he kind of planted the seed. It was something that really interested okay. me, and I kind of, kind of ran with that, you know? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now, how do you break up the kata? Do you do it into individual sequences? And what sort of level of, of self-defense are you? Is it really to, just to diffuse the situation? Or is it, you know, what do you have levels of application? Yeah, well, we, we, we teach all, all, we work a lot on uh, avoidance skills, what we call the soft skills. Um, you know, the escape skills are something that we drill and practice live as well. When it gets to the uh, physical confrontation, we have one level and it's just whatever it needs to stop it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for, for the bunkai, um, we, we try and keep it as practical and as direct as we can. We're always looking for that really quick finish, get the job done and... and and, 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 and yeah, and, and get out of there. Um, so that's what I, for all my students, that's the way we work. If the beginner comes through the door, they're wanting to learn self-defense. I, I don't want them learning something useful in a year, two years, three years. Sure. I want them to learn something from uh, day one. So we teach practical skills right from the very beginning. So then if they're only with us for a few months before they leave and do whatever else they want to do, hopefully we've given them some, uh, some useful skills in that time. Okay, cool. Now, what, what sort of conditioning do you do for your training? Yeah, no, I'm a grand believer in conditioning. Technique's really important, but your mental resilience and your physical condition are, are just as important, you know? Yeah. So we, we do a lot of uh, conditioning drills. I, um, I find that, that I train with some really high-level judo guys who are 20 years younger than me and yeah. international-level athletes, and they're great to, uh, to train with for the conditioning. I do an awful lot of pad work and bag work. Yeah. And the karate side of it, one of my uh, main training sessions uh, every week, I get up at half four in the morning, I drive all the wow. way to Huddersfield, yeah. and I train with uh, Peter Con Stein and uh, Brian Seabright. Yeah. We do a uh, um, kind of uh, brutal session on, we call them the training day sessions yeah. on a Thursday morning. Not, not to be mixed up with the animal day session with Jeff Thompson. With Jeff Thompson, there, yeah. yeah, something different. I've done a couple of those with Jeff as well. Uh, cool. Peter's obviously Jeff's co chief yeah. instructor of the, the BCA, but these are like uh, high impact, high energy kind of pad works yeah. and anaerobic drills to create that physical distress and mental distress, but then we still have to keep hitting hard and we still have to keep good form. So yeah. they're, they're uh, the great, and I like, uh, you know, I, I run a little, um, I live in a great place for running, beautiful scenery, and yeah, um, I, like, I like, I lift weights a couple of times a week and stuff, but I find that, you know, the martial arts training, high intensity martial arts training, mm. that, that, I love that. Yeah. Now you're a specialist in the bunkai application. When you first started out in karate and you're learning all the different forms, and what inspired you to, to look deeper and research into the kata application? Well, I think that was all part of, came through my uh, the, the group that I worked with. That was just something you know was, you were all encouraged to think and question. I know in some quarters of the martial arts that's strongly discouraged, okay. but that was never the, the the case for me. So over the years, you get into it, you get into it a little bit more, you find a few things, and over the years it kind of grows and grows and grows until um, yeah, I do what I do now. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, a lot of, there's a, a, a few different views on, on the card application and how you, how you apply it, whether the, the, the person's doing the uh, full card and people are attacking them, or you're taking out the th individual sequences yes, yeah. and applying them as a one-on-one -on -one situation. How, how do you view that? Yeah, we, we, we do it all as, um, it, it's one-on-one. It's -on -one. We do drills for multiple opponents, yeah. but my, my view is if I engage too much with one guy, the other guys get me. Yeah. So we call it uh, skittle shooting, which is a, a phrase taken from pistol shooting, but we, yeah. you hit one guy, you move, you hit the other guy, and we stay light on our feet, and we get out of there. Hit anything that moves and run. Yeah. Uh, for the kata, when we're drilling those techniques, it's one guy at once, okay? Well, although we will drill it in multiple scenarios, but yeah. we don't do the kind of compass point thing that um, the... That, 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 yeah, you sometimes see. You know. yeah. I'm interested in the drills and how you put those together because looking at your DVDs, you, you, you lay them out really well. So you've got slow motion, step by step, and they do full, full power, so full speed. So you can get to see, okay, that's what it's really going to be, how effective it's going to be, and then how you can develop the skills within those drills. So is that a sort of thing that you really work on? Yeah, we, we, have, we have lots of different kinds of drills, um, live drills, semi-live drills, we call them, compliant drills. To begin with, we, we like to uh, take people baby steps. Yeah. So to begin with the, the, the cutter drills, we 
we, we'll teach them the first few moves of the kata, we get them with a the partner, they do the bunkai to it. And all our drills follow a set pattern. You do the bunkai on one side of the opponent, you do it on the other side, oh, and yeah. he does it to you on both sides. Yeah. So that's the way we kind of um, we set them up on our standard format uh, uh, drills. Yeah. Yeah, it's just sideways stepping, that's it, I need to copy that. So everything from my karate training for months and months was nothing but uh, uh, Nahanji. Okay, I'll, just, I'll go I'll do it 50 times and I'll find ways of working you know, slowly, quickly, with weights in my hands. I found all kinds of different ways of working. So that's one reason I love it. The other reason I love it is, as I say, it's my travel cat. You know, it doesn't take much space to practice. Theoretically, I could have done it on the aeroplane on the way over, although they probably would have got upset if I had, you know. Uh, so I like it for that reason. And I just find it very practical to really kind of direct, very um, uh, effective form. And coming to the super guy who did it, he had kind of said that this was the easiest and hardest cut to work. So I, I think I know what he means by that. In terms of it's easy, as in the motion was dead simple. I told my wife here, my wife used to dance, she could do it within a few hours. So she won that bet, right? She looked great. Full of caution, he did it for about the first nine years of his training. Uh, he told uh, the Utsuka, the founder of one, said that this was his favourite cut, and he said there was something profoundly deep about it, and it would take more than a lifetime to master. That's a guy who's a grand master in, in karate and jiu-jitsu. Says that this, this cat will take more than a lifetime master. We'll do it in three hours. Right? Go on, but we'll try. Um, any other ones? Oh yeah, Motor. You know, like Motor, the fear fighter, that was his main cat, and that was the main one he told his dojo. We've got a guy who said that nothing is more harmful to mankind than a martial art that can't be used in self-defense. And that for him, this was the cat that he kind of, uh, he, he worked with mainly. Okay? Do you ever remember that? Um, Generally, when you get past the start of the cabinet, we're all pretty much the same. You know, hands are a little bit lower or higher, or positions vary, or the foot will come in in different ways, but they're not radically different. Mm -hmm. um, but the start tends to be a little bit different depending on what, what style you've got. Right? In one we have this unusual thing at the start. Seeing as I'm the only one about here, I'll miss that off. Right? Um, and then it tends to be. Okay? Don't care what's trotting, so I just don't get back around. Okay, which is what this bit is in the one of if you're interested. The other one is I come over my head and win it. In my own dojo, we call it the instant crash helmet. Alright, you know, so the guy's throwing shots in, rather than saying it was a hook or whatever it was, just come up and go. Okay, so he starts with a shot, boom, 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 boom. Okay, I'm moving towards it. Is everyone alright with that? To be clear, that's not a start technique. If I didn't start here, we'd be doing this and running that. Huh? The, the way uh, I would like it, I was like, bang, and that's the end of it. But if he's already started shooting shots, I'm going to come up and I'm going to charge him. So you're okay with that? So to, uh, to start off with, all of you do with your hands open when you're punching your, each other's arms. Right? So the partner's going to just kind of come in with uh, limbs, swinging shots. It'll be a little bit wild if you like. A couple of hands to come there and move in. The interesting thing about this cat, most people are right handed. Right? So on this bit here, if you think about it, you could have either hand in front. But we don't, we have that hand in front. Because this hand then, the one that's dealing with the right hand, is braced. The one that's dealing with the left hand is the brakes. You see what I mean? So it's like, okay, so I come from the end of the straight hand, and that hand's going to be slightly stronger. Does everyone understand what I mean by that? And because that, because it's more likely to throw solid shots with that hand than with most people right handed. Just one of these little subtleties in kata that's, a, that's, uh, that's fairly important. Does everyone remember that? Then we'll get in there, then we can kata him. And the first thing we do is go to get in there. So we just cover up when we move. Does everyone remember that? Nice and gentle, just playing with it. Okay? 
So, so, so we get into here. We'll deal with the head thing in a minute. This is where I want to put that. So, guy starts swinging shots. Boom, straight in. I got the rim in here. Once I do that, he's swinging shots at my head now. They're not that effective. You can still get reasonable power in a body shot. You want to do that for me? There you are, But not great power, because again, his shoulders are limited. But you get more power into them than this. For me, though, the important thing to protect is this. That's the control center. If that goes down, everything else has got to go with it. So that's the one I want to protect more than anything else. So we're okay with that one. So we charge you once we've got the pop. And this is kind of represented in a very formal way in a kind of like this. And then we start playing with the rest of the stuff. Okay? Got your hands and fists and swing. If you're uh, this kind of on TV. <laughs> but if you watch two kids fight, not that I'm suggesting you let them fight for too long, especially if this is going to be broken. Uh, you'll see how they, they'll, um, they'll, 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 they'll do that. But my boys, you know, when they were younger, if they can't like kids do, they'll lose the temper and go, the club. You know, because that's a kind of natural reaction. You know? So uh, when guys are in stress, that's all normal will do. And it can be highly effective too, as well. Just because someone doesn't throw a really nice, neat, technical martial arts punch doesn't mean they're not effective. I've, I don't know if I've told this already, but there's a good friend of mine who got into loads and loads of fights when he was younger. And we were talking about this one day, he said, well, when I got into a fight, he said, I hit them with my right. If they were still standing, I'd headbutt them. If they were still standing, I'd run away. And I, now, this guy had a level of effectiveness that most martial arts would long for. Right? With a crude punch and a crude headbutt. You know, I wasn't even technically a good puncher. I know that, because I started teaching him karate. You know? um, it kind of improved the, the, the finesse of his punching, if you like. But it's, um, you know, a wild shot can take you out just as well as a clean one. Right, so we want to practice sometimes defending against a nice clean one, some other times a wild one. Is everyone right with that? Okay, when we get in there, there's a few things we can do. This is what we're going to do first. Because it's like the option, the idea is to escape. So what, what can really help is if I mess up his posture. So I'm going to put my hands up a little bit on his head, then I'm going to follow the motion of the camera. So I'll just, just put it there for the right. so, uh, I'll do it without the arms first, then we'll kind of put those in. So I'll have to grab in here. Then what I do is, so my forearms at the minute are low because I want to uh, keep them against his shoulder so he can't hit me. What I'll then do is bring my hands onto his head for me. So I'll lift them up that little bit. Now I'm losing a bit of control over the shoulders but I'm getting leverage on the neck. If I was just to try and pull him forward from here, the big strong guy tenses his back up and I won't be able to move him. But if I do this, I'm pulling against his neck. Once his neck starts moving, his body will fall. So I get to there and I push through that gap right there. So we're okay with that. The posture's now messed up. My next big thing for me is I'll, I'll set my, my datum so I know where he is, and I'll have a fist. Okay, that's why I like doing it. But you could run and I'll show you some options in a second. You're about to ask me questions, sorry. And what if he resists with his neck muscles? Yeah, I, I would suggest you try it. Because <laughs> uh, it's nigh on No, no, no. The reason I say this is it's nigh on impossible to do. Uh, because I'm using my weight on it. Um, I, I used to do a demo, but I stopped doing it because I nearly snapped the guy's back. So let's, let's try it. <laughs> um, what I, uh, what I used to put my arms on, I said, right, don't let me pull you on. And then kind of resist, and then you know, I'd kind of pull, 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 and then lift my feet off the ground. And the really strong guys can hold me. So I don't know what I have in kilos, it's about 94 or 5. Hopefully. Um, and they could put it hold me. You know, the muscles of the back, they could hold me. Not for long, and then one guy in the back popped once, and I never did it ever again. The same guys who were happy, they could hang, I could hang off them. As soon as I start pulling on the neck, because the muscles of the neck aren't quite as strong and I'm using the weight if I need to, very, very difficult to resist. Yeah? Well, look at this in a minute. If he doesn't bend, you elbow him. That kind of, kind of shows you that, but we'll come to that in a second, okay? So uh, I've got the wrong from there to here, push through that gap. Whatever you want to do from there is up to you, and I'll give you some options in a second. Is everyone around that? So the camera's just got right. This is the lesson of the cat on the map. A guy attacks you, make sure you protect your head. Once you get in there, establish the grip. Disrupt his posture on the foot. Okay, so we've already got a little less than the first two people. Then around that, follow by whatever you like. That kind of just kind of gets you into a position of massive advantage. Okay, I'm going to go that and move on. The How Qing Gong.
what are your options? You've got, there's loads of stuff you can do, we'll look at the options again, right? Um, once you've got the, the head moving from there, one of the things you can do is you've got the, the body starts to drop and the arms start to pull off. Yeah. So we're going to do it slowly and gently if you just kind of give me a tap on your body. Right? Yes. In that, that application, it'll be slammed on. You know? So that's not what we're going to do now. Yeah. I want to just we'll compare a couple of things first. So, uh, what I want to do is I want to do like a standard kind of front chop. Nothing wrong with this technique. I like this technique. Okay, I'm just going to sh c compare and contrast two versions for you. So, uh, so if I pull it down to here, put my forearm on his neck from there. Get my real one see, which will turn out is my posture. Right, so I'm going, to, I'm going to slowly put it on, you just kind of tap the leg or whatever when you, you, you know, we reach the point of where I'm Okay, so I'm kind of like this. Yeah. So I'm going to lean quite a way back. And we're roughly the same height. Right. So what I like to do when I do that technique is I want to keep his head here rather than putting it under my arm. It's my preference, but you know, both techniques are fine. So I get him there. Right. So from there as a pull, I have to move. So I've got okay with that one, you see so you can get a different variation, right? So if we do the counter, we'll take him down, pull on the sink. That little kind of sideways shift has even more pressure on the neck as well. So when you practice it, you do it very slowly and very gently. Get everyone all right with that. Slower than you think you need to do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, so we've got there, push the head down, slip the hands in under his chin. You see where that one's gone? And up there. And from there, I step across, and that's it. Half last location, boom, and then we're on doing what we were doing before, all right? So now we're slowly pulling it on so the guy can feel the other pressure on the neck and the taps out. Actual application requires a big amount of pressure on the neck very, very quickly. The fact that he's sinking and the fact that you're uh, uh, putting the arms up as your body drops isn't that. Then we're out there and then kind of putting it in context. You know, we've been talking about this all week. It's often the little things in the camera that are important. But the bit of no one notice, so there's been a slight side of shift, a slight drop of your body weight. The arms are starting to move up. You know, and these are things that all kind of count. So okay, well, we're going to look at the, lots of kind of functions in this first part of it. Right? That's a nice one for what we're doing there. Right? Arms in, push down, start moving. And then we'll come back to this. Those guys that when we trained on uh, Sunday, I think, we got into some flow drills and we did some of those offensive training. We're going to kind of miss all that off by now. So we're not kind of repeating, we're going to stick with this first move for a little bit. Okay, just so people have alternative views. Right? Okay, cool, let's have a little help. Now, I'm going to do it now then. <laughs> Now, there's, a, there's a, a book called um, The Happiness Hypothesis. And as I've said before, once you've bought online, and the Dave Grossman book I mentioned, you can buy that one next. Yeah? And it's a guy who's looked at what, uh, scientifically, what makes people happy. Okay? He's done a study of what makes people happy. And he's compared, compared that against um, uh, received wisdom. Okay? So things like, that which does not kill me serves to make me stronger. You know, that's true until I think he said you hit 50. Yeah, when you're below 50 and bad things happen to you, you do benefit from it. Over a certain age, people generally don't integrate them into their life in the same way, okay? Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that. But one of the ones at the start of the book, because it's a layman's book, it's like, I want you to think about your conscious mind and your subconscious mind, like the rider on the back of an elephant, okay? So the conscious mind is the rider, the rider on the top, and the subconscious mind is the elephant. And to a certain degree, the rider can control the elephant. When that elephant decides he wants to do something, he can't do it. Right? And the exact words you use, and no offense is intended here, but when the exact word you use, he says, and then this is the rider that comes the elephant's life. Right? So <laughs> the, the, the elephant's doing whatever he wants to do, and the rider kind of justifies it. And I'm reading this book, I think that's interesting, that's interesting. So I walk through to my kitchen, and some cake there for my, um, I think it was my daughter's birthday party. I look at the cake, and I'm like, you know, I, don't, I want the cake. The subconscious wants that cake. And I'm not even, it's bad for me, and I want to lose a bit of weight, so I'm like, at that point I override it. Yeah. A couple of days later, I'm going there, and the cake's still sitting there, it's looking even better than it did, you know, so I think, yeah, go on, I love it. But it's okay, because I can do it with the carbs, because I've got the gym, and it'll be good for energy, and it's a shame to see it going away. <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, just it's fine. As soon as I finished it, I think, I shouldn't have eaten that. Yeah, but that moment, we've all done this, right? The reason I make that point is, when you do chunks and strangles to a degree, you can let people do it. But after a certain point, the subconscious part of your brain knows why are we letting this person strangle us? Right? And then so you start, you know you see yourself, you start tapping out and hitting. Especially if it's complex, it's different when you're sparring and you're dreading them to. When you're training the point, you start to tap it out. So you do it for a minute or two, then we've got to move on to something else. So everyone will okay with uh, that. So I just want to look at some other functions of, uh, of this before we move on. Right? Um, we've talked about this before, but the way I see this camera is I see it. Motions on it are uh, uh, sole function. 
and have multiple use cases. So we've got a very small cabinet that can contain a massive amount of data. Right? Um, and an absolutely wonderful form. The more I think about it, the more you realise the more there is to learn about. It. So I just want to do a little bit more for this. So we we'll use it as that cram. In my own teaching, I divide what I call my book guide kind of, uh, my primary and secondary book guide. Kind of. So the primary stuff is what I teach first and foremost. Yeah? Um, it's the closest I can say this is the application. Right? Once we get to a certain point, I do one with the secondary book guide. Kind of. So I say, here's some other things you can do with that one. So I'm okay with, with that one. So I want my students to be able to think about how cats can be applied rather than just copy what I tell them to do. Okay, up to a certain point I want them to copy it. Or sell the long range. I don't care about your opinion, you haven't got enough today experience to have the one that counts. Right? Intermediate grades, high grades, I'm interested in what you can have one. Some versions of the small as well, as you know, kind of steps across, you haven't need it. You know, the kind of knee comes up that little bit. Yeah, so I mean, these are little things that kind of, some styles don't have it, some styles make you know, bigger ones, some styles they Great to look up what the style did to learn what my emotion does. Um, I don't know if this one here. The nice and gentle little topic. Um, so from here you'll we'll just kind of see. So if we start on this crack, okay, so that, that crack in the map, that's what we're kind of looking at. I'll show the I'll show the TV, I know you all can't see at the moment, but I, I just want to show you what happened. At the moment our heads are in a line. When I move my hands to here and do what the captain does, all the heads drop off to one side a little bit. So I step across and then I lift my knee up. They were okay with that one. You know, it's kind of like predictable response. The human body is set to respond in a certain way. So the old masters study this and then they call that in their kind of, yeah. So the technique we've got, different people call it different things. The, we take the, like an S-lock it's sometimes called, because your arms are the kind of S-shape, or as S-shaped as the human arm can get. Uh, the other one, that, or, or a centre lock, is the other one it gets. Because that hand wants to be on the centre. Take it across here, the arm straightens up. We don't want that. We want to keep the arm bent so we can't rotate the shoulder. So he grabs. Push, yeah, pin the hand, cut the water to it, and then throw my hands over it. And then my hands are going to assume the same posture, they can't start it. Okay? Over there. Over the back. Boom. Do you ever remember that? You wouldn't stop there either just because it can't stop. Do you ever okay with that one? So, that, that nice, simple kind of uh, basic kind of wrist locking technique. Um, it's the same, uh, same initial uh, posture. Well, let's give that one a go. Yeah. Just attributing it to the cafe. You know, we all didn't kind of recognise that. In fact, it's amazing how we can do the same move over and over again and not notice that if we did it without somebody, it would look exactly the same as the cafe. So, no, no. so my, my um, uh, version of this is, comes from uh, one. I, I personally, I don't care what version of it you do. You know, to, to me, it's all the same stuff. It's just um, packaged differently. The example I give is uh, where uh, the town that I come from is the town of Wordsworth, the poet, was born in, and all the daffodils and all that kind of stuff. So I, I always use this as an example, right? But if I was to write down, you know, I wandered lonely as a cloud, if I was to write that poem down, right? and it's, my handwriting's really bad, so I write it down, I write it down with a red bar, right? and a crumpled piece of white paper. So I write that poem down, okay, and we stick it on the wall. If somebody else does it with a laser jet printer and types it all out, okay, and let's uh, put it on a red piece of paper. So you look at it from a distance and they are completely different. And you're close, you read what's written and you think, no, they're actually exactly the same. And that's how I kind of see camera, right? So you can look at the shoulder cam version or the wide version or whatever. And on the surface, you look at it from a distance and go, they are different. But when you get into the actual information contained with them, you say, no, it's essentially the same. Is everyone okay with that? So I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to do uh, my version, which uh, mine, the wide version. Um, oh man, I'll just have a little walk through for you, then we'll talk about some variations, all right? The main thing is this bit at the start. And then we've got this bit, which we haven't got done yet, but we'll make a fact it. Essentially that bit, I'll show you quickly. Essentially that bit is, once you're in here, you've got this head movement from one side to the other, it's so it can't bite me. Okay? So I've got to do another thing, so if I tip my head in, grind it across, it can't bite me on that side. If I go to this side, I'll grind it that way. And then I can do this kind of movement here. Turn around with that, so you put that hand off, it's once you've grabbed it, you can do this. If it hasn't worked, like you were saying before, you're about to pull it down, use my head to make sure that his teeth aren't near something that we can bite. I have two friends who are missing the tops of their ears because of that. Okay? One, one was in a bar, the guy jumped in from behind and bit his ears off from the rear from the top. The other guy got into a fight, got kicked in the groin, crushed one of his testicles, that makes me wince every time I think about it. And then, then, then he got, uh, got the top of his ears. They were both ugly men at the start, so it's not a bad thing. Okay? 
Uh, but, you know, we've got to be kind of wary of that. Let me start with head controls work and make sure you keep the point you're on there. Right, so I'll, I'll kind of walk through mine, right? So we'll start like that. Like that there's common here. We're an expert within the business kind of ball of society. Some take a little bit higher. But the information is the same, which we'll see in the next bit. So, when we talk about um, what we've got for four tonne, controlling limbs, um, the non striking this is important. In kata, the non striking hand will be getting limbs out of the way or telling you where he is. Do you ever remember that? And the primary um, tactic, if you like, is to hit this. Right? If I can get him in the, you know, the neck, the jawline, I can take him out. Okay? Once you're conscious, he's not a threat. The thing that's going to stop me getting into him is the arms. That's the arms I need to get out of the way. Second thing is, once we've got the arms out of the way, because fighting is so chaotic, I need to know where they're headed. Because it moves all in a real fight. Okay? And, you know, if, you, if you've had any experience with real fight, and you try to hit a guy in the head. It's a great big thing like this. You know? It's hard to do. Okay? Hard to do. You know? Unless you kind of control it. So what we're going to do is raise the opening motion. You know, the arms crossed. You know, some styles do this as the arms come through, or the step, and then go on for the next one. So we've got the arm out of the way, keep it out of the way, and then drive my arm to the side of his neck. Is everyone okay with that one? Doesn't really matter where I put it in the neck. How does this relate to what you sense as a technique of the fight to the side? That's correct. And that's what I saw, I'm taking up a sideways angle. Yeah, great point. So, yeah, we said the angle in the cat that always represents the angle you are in relation to your opponent. So, because the motion is side, in the cat side is on, so I take the sideways possible. Do you have okay with that one? Yeah. Um, so, that's where the first strike goes in there. Second one, for the, that would follow straight through, of course, but, you know, I'm not doing that now. Once I've done that, I put my hand on the side of his head. Then we see the second function of the non striking hand is telling you where he's heading. So, if he moves in a little bit, it's okay because I'm moving that. I just elbow my whole hand and I've trained myself to do with the cat a thousand of times. If I don't have a hand there and he moves backwards or drops or something, I miss. But my hand on it moves anywhere he likes, I feel it. So I know exactly where I need to go to. So I'm okay with those first two motions. So we'll take the arm out of the way, grab it. One, two. So I'm okay with those. Either one of them independently can knock a guy out. Four of them in the neck will do that for you. I'll open the door and do that for you too. Okay? Have a little go with that and we'll do the next bit. Just want to crank his neck and stamp on his head. <laughs> just in case we haven't finished him off just yet, eh? Yeah! Yeah! So then set through, four, finish and move away. Five, take the headlock, set through, four, finish. Don't miss the Martial Arts Channel, your portal for fun, fitness and fantastic moves.